very happy to introduce our speaker tonight. Our guest speaker is Harold Munson. He and his wife Sarah live on a small farm in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, having lived there from New York. <laughs> from New York, Mohawk, Mohawk Valley 16 years ago. They have three grown children, seven grandchildren, living in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Harold has spoken for Stonecrop Ministries on many occasions in Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Alaska. That's why you come with me. Otherwise, you never see. <laughs> he and Sarah also had the privilege of working in Israel for six weeks in 20, oh, 2010. So I'm happy to introduce Hill to you tonight. Thank you. No, I wish I had your voice. But I don't. My voice is softer. So can you hear me in the back? All right. If I kind of uh, decay a little bit, would you please wave? It won't be a bit. <laughs> I'll make sure Ralph's looking this way. Well, I'm looking forward to this evening because uh, about 25 years ago, I was sitting out there listening to a male speaker like I'm doing tonight at a guest night. I was attending primarily to please my wife, Sarah. Some of you men might be here for the same reason. Uh, maybe, you know, you just not quite sure why you are here, but <laughs> we're glad you are here tonight. Um, it took a couple of years for me to realize that that guest night was a pivotal event in my life. And in order for you to understand why it was such a pivotal event, I need to take you back to some earlier events in my life. And by the way, ever got the chairs facing the way you want because I don't want to look at the back of your heads. I'm going to have you looking up this way. So be sure you're comfortable. Well, I'm going to put this on a, uh, might say a GPS journey. You know those GPS uh, systems we have now that are so great? And we can use that uh, as, a, as a means of getting through uh, this little message I want to give you tonight. And I'm not going to hold you as late as you think. You see that clock? It's quarter till eight. <coughs> So don't panic. <laughs> Remember being a small child? I think for most of us in this room, that's kind of a distant memory. But I remember my grandparents giving me a Lionel train for my seventh birthday. And I remember my dad taking me uh, fishing up in the Adirondack Mountain Street and we fried trout over a fire for breakfast. I occasionally went to Sunday school if my grandparents took me. But I remember my dad taking me hunting now, for most boys, the first hunting trip is a big deal. And, you know, little things that we do for our kids, our grandkids, sometimes we have no idea the impact that a little thing is going to have. So for a brief moment, I want to jump ahead 40 years from my childhood to the childhood of our youngest son, Matt. Now, when he was in college, Matt was required to write a paper on the three most outstanding sports events of his life. Now, it certainly would include a time we took him to a professional basketball game in Philadelphia, or when he got to see the Lakers play out in Los Angeles. But the item of sports he saved at the top of his list sounds much less exciting. And it had to do when he began running track in high school. See, I was away on a business trip when Matt's first big meet came up. And it was questionable if I could get back in time. But the plane landed on time in Syracuse, the long drive from the airport went smoothly, and I found a parking space right near the field. So as I got out of my truck, the starter's gun went off. And it was Matt's race. So I ran down to the track to watch him compete. What do you suppose Matt's number one all-time sports memory of his life is? It's the sight of his father running across the track and field in a three-piece business suit, cheering and clapping and calling out his name. And he sprinted ahead in an amazing burst, winning the race. But he said that moment began his love for track and led to a career 
as a Division I college track coach. Just a little thing to get into a boys track meet on time. Well, I had no idea how the little things were shaping me for a lifetime as we returned to my own boyhood. I got home from uh, school one day and I found a little note on the door said my stepmother was in the hospital waiting for a baby to be born. You know, my parents had divorced when I was seven, and my mother ended up 400 miles away in Ohio, right near uh, Akron. I was living in New York State at the time. My sister was, was living with our grandparents. And so our family was really split up. But in my own boyhood and growing up with a stepmother, you know, I, there were some good times, but there were some strange times. When this little baby was born, my new little sister, she became the delight of my life. We would sit together in a big chair on Sunday evenings, munch popcorn, and watch Lassie on black and white TV. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> well, I got an interest in building rockets, and I went to the library, because we didn't have the internet, to figure out how to make gunpowder. I thought that would be good fuel. And it did turn out to be pretty good fuel, but I made my rockets out of wood, so they always burned up. <laughs> well, I had a friend who had a father who was a machinist, and he offered to make us an aluminum rocket. So the big day came, and he presented the aluminum rocket, and we filled it full of gunpowder, probably the equivalent of 10 or 12 shotgun shells. And had a little fuse that we made, and uh, he and I, my friend and I, ran in, the, in his garage after we lit the fuse. Well, this, this big brother came out of the house, didn't think much of us, 13-year-olds. He said, what are you kids doing? We said, get in here. That thing's full of gunpowder. And he said, you don't know how to make real gunpowder just before the explosion. And I'm sure he still wears a scar today where the piece of a rock went through his leg. Well, you know, I always loved being outdoors, so our move to the country was fine. I had my own little shed with bandy chickens and doing my experiments and things. My teen years saw a lot of struggle with my stepmother, and I, I went to work for a veterinarian. I saved enough money to buy my first gun, a little 22 rifle. I still have it today, by the way. But I bought that in absolute defiance of my stepmother. At 17, I went to visit my mother and now stepfather in Ohio. I had been there uh, nine years before. Now they had a little seven-year-old boy. Um, I was not doing well in school. I was failing. The relationship with my stepmother had become so strained that I moved in with my grandparents. Well, this was a topic of conversation in Ohio. And one evening, my stepfather asked me a stunning question. He said, would you like to come live with us? And he wisely said, just sleep on it tonight and tell us in the morning. He and my mother had already discussed it. Well, it was a, it was a summer before my senior year. That's a time when most teenagers, teenagers would rather die than move 400 miles away. Um, you know, it would mean leaving my, most of my family, including my little sister that I love, my part-time job, all my friends. And through my amazement as I look back, I said, yes, I'd like to come live with you. And so we left immediately from Ohio back to New York to drive 400 miles to get a few of my friends. No, I'll never forget the sight of my little sister, so bewildered, who could not understand what her big brother was leaving. My arrival in Ohio began a very beneficial time for me with a loving stepfather. He and my mother at that time really rescued me when I was single. I made a lot of great new friends, including a sophomore cheerleader named Sarah. <laughs> and, you know, that was one of the GPS points in my life's journey. God provided Sarah. Well, I was soon in college and listening with interest as, as we uh, went through some of the courses there and some of the philosophies I began to hear, some things I really caused me to begin questioning things I'd heard about God earlier in life. And I never attended church very much. But I pretty much began to come to the conclusion <coughs> that there was no God, that this life is probably all there is. I had questions I'm sure you had throughout life. Like, if there is a God who's a loving God, why is there so much pain and suffering in this world? Why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? 
And if there is a way to heaven, are there lots of ways to get there? I remember thinking that uh, I hope the good in my life outweighed the bad, the bad, the bad in case there was a heaven and I wanted to get in, of course, if there was. I didn't realize at the time I was comparing myself to the wrong standard, that the requirement is that we get things right every time. It's not a matter of getting more good than bad. It's the idea like this. If we're driving 65 miles an hour in a 55 zone, we're doing something wrong. We can't fix it tomorrow by driving 45 in a 55 zone. It's done. So once a sin is committed, when something is done wrong, it's done. But I was uh, thinking that, I wasn't really thinking about that that deeply at that time. I was in college and I was thinking more about engineering studies. That was most of my thinking and during that time, Sarah and I got married in college and upon my graduation, we moved to Virginia and I went to work for the DuPont Company. I joined the Toastmasters Club in Virginia and I gave a speech on atheism. You know what? It's amazing that I was talking about atheism despite the miracle of our first son being born, Mark. We moved to Delaware and Laurel was born. We moved to New York State and Matt was born. We quit moving. <laughs> <laughs> well, the years began to fill up quickly. And our country home was a beehive of activity. You know, my career took off with rapid promotions in a large corporation. I, uh, I was on our local school board and on our local community college board for several years. I enjoyed that. Our family life was great. We had school events, Cub Scouts, and baseball in the backyard, and basketball in the driveway, and horses, and wonderful family vacations. But spiritual things were not a priority. See, I was teaching my children by my example that God was not important. Fortunately, my wife Sarah was teaching that God was important. You know what? At that time in my life, with my career doing so well, with things going so well, I was confident, I was self-reliant, and I was, uh, I was respected, I guess you'd say, and I just really consider myself successful. But then something happened. There was a young man in my group at work who was nearly killed in an industrial accident. I sat beside his mother and dad in our little small town hospital. And the nurse came out of the operating room and knelt down in front of his mother and said that their son's heart had been pierced by a flying piece of metal. It was in his heart wall at the time. Only the miracle of timing and the availability of a skilled surgeon with Vietnam field experience saved that young man's life. It was miraculous what he did for him. But that event really shook me up for some reason. It just, all of a sudden, I wasn't quite so confident as I had been. I began noticing Sarah's renewed interest in Christian things. She liked coming to these Christian women's clubs. And she took our children to church. I really wish that I'd given Mark and Laura and Matt memories of my saying thanks for our <coughs> for taking them to church. But I was teaching them, again, to ignore God. You know, on Sunday mornings, what I did, we had started uh, planning an apple orchard for retirement years to have a pick-your-own orchard. And I went up to work in that on Sunday mornings, kind of giving myself a lame excuse that in case there was a God, at least I was out enjoying his creation. Well, you know, the apple trees grew, and after a few years, they started to produce. And we sent out notices that said, if you like apples, you'll love Munson's Orchard. And people came. Families would come and they would spend hours hand selecting every apple. Others would be in and out in minutes. We had some people come to our pick your own orchard and ask why the apples weren't already picked. I never understood that. Little children loved to come in yellow school buses, pick apples to take home to mom and dad. So you see, it was convenient for me to be up on Sunday mornings out in the orchard, not doing anything about church. Well, this was kind of another GPS point because God did something. Let me tell you about this speaker. The speaker was uh, a man who got up in front and said only one thing that I remember. 
he said, do you think there might be a God? Well, that's a great question. Because if there's one chance in a trillion that God exists, wouldn't it be important to try and find out? But it was bothering me. So one day with nobody else around, I said, okay, God, if you're really there, I just want to know it. I want to know the truth. But what is truth? You know, that's a question that Pilate asked Jesus. How do you know if something is really true? You can't always trust your senses, can you? Because magicians cause us to see things that don't really happen. So how do you know if something is really true? You know, we teach our young people that there is no absolute truth, that what's good for you or right for you may not be right for somebody else. You've heard this statement, there is no absolute truth. When somebody says that to you, there is no absolute truth, ask them if that is absolutely true. <laughs> See, it's a foolish statement because it disproves itself as soon as you say it. There are absolutes. There are real truths. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And he always told the truth. He said there was only one way to get to heaven. Well, how can a person know the truth and be sure? That's what I want to know. And I figured if God was real and all-knowing and all-powerful, he could certainly reveal truth to me. Wouldn't he want me to know the truth? Well, as only God could do, he provided situations. That's kind of a GPS point. God provided situations. An amazing chain of events took place, as I look back, that only God could have put in place. People, places, circumstances, all working together to lead me toward the truth. Sarah was reading a book called Evidence of the Man's Averted. Some of you may have read it. I was fascinated to read how the author started out to disprove the Bible. And as he compiled historical evidence, looked at historical findings, looked at the prophecies about Jesus that came true, he became convinced that the Bible is true, that Jesus is the Son of God, who willingly came to earth to die for our sins. Well, I began to go to church a little more frequently. And one Easter Sunday, the pastor asked this question in his sermon. He said, what is it going to take for you to accept Christ as your personal Savior. I wrote him a note afterwards. And the note said, I don't know what it's going to take. But I was obviously thinking about it. There was something else I didn't know. People were praying for me. Sometimes alone, sometimes in groups, sometimes in tears because they loved me. And if I had known it at the time, I probably would have been angry. But I continued listening and reasoning and thinking about this. On a vacation trip from New York down to Florida, we stopped at a church in Virginia, and the pastor, after this message, gave an invitation to anyone who wanted to receive Christ as their Savior. And I responded. But you know, I still wasn't quite sure what had happened. It was weeks later, and Sarah and I were talking up in our living room back in New York, and she said, you know, I don't know where you stand anymore. That was a good question. Where did I stand? I suddenly told her I believed it. I believed enough to accept the part I did not understand. So I didn't have all the answers. Only God has all the answers. If I had them all, I would be God. That's not the case. But this was a transformation in my life. I admitted I wasn't perfect. I believed that Jesus was the Son of God who came willingly to earth to die and pay for my sins. And that rose again in victory over death and ascended into heaven and said he was going, to, he was going to prepare a place for me and that he was going to come back to earth one day. Well, what is it that makes this Christianity so different? It's that resurrection. You see, that's the most well-documented historical event of the times. Christ is alive. He's the only religious leader still living. He's the one that worship. And you know, this decision to accept Christ as our Savior is not something that someone can do for us. It's, it's a very personal decision. The Bible makes that real clear. That we have to admit who we are. We have to recognize who Christ is. We have to admit that we need forgiveness and that he does pay that debt. 
we're not Christians because parents are Christians or we go to a certain church. You know, parents can teach us and we can have good preachers and we can have priests, but the Bible is clear that we have to make our own decision. You know, it was to a religious leader that Jesus, to Nicodemus, that Jesus said this, I will tell you, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. It's as if Jesus is kind of shouting down through the ages, even today, saying you can't get to heaven by being good, by being religious. You must be born again. What's that mean? It means having a relationship with Christ. Well, I was spiritually reborn that moment, and I acknowledged him as my Savior. And of all the events of my life, the one that mattered most to God had finally taken place. It took 45 years. Why so long? Pride. Not wanting to admit my dependence on anybody else. Not wanting to admit that I could not be totally self-reliant. That's uh, an amazing thing when you think about it, that I was saying to God, I don't need you. Or I was willing to go get to the end of my life and say, I did it my way. But you know, someday, self-righteous people are going to get to heaven and hear the saddest words in eternity when Christ says, depart from me. I never knew you. How sad that would be. There's a lot of excuses that people use to avoid becoming a Christian. I bet you've heard this one. That church is full of hypocrites. Or I know some real jerks that say they're Christians. Well, that's true. But of course, why would you let hypocrites and jerks keep you from finding out the truth? People do that. How about this one? Well, maybe later, but right now I'm just too busy. Well, the Bible has an answer for that. It says, today is the day of salvation. We're not guaranteed one more day. You know, there's a, a real twisted excuse that I use, and it's this. How about the other religions? Aren't Christians just being bigoted and arrogant to claim their way is the only way? First of all, Christians didn't say that. God said it. But I realize now how arrogant I was being, telling God I didn't like the way he provided and he provided it at great cost, the cost of his only son. And what about just excuses before God? Listen to what he says. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. God doesn't give us the option of standing before him and saying, I didn't know you were there. The evidence is overwhelming. Well, perhaps uh, being arrogant and things like that just took me a longer time than most. And everybody's got a streak of pride in them. That's the original sin. <coughs> I now realize that was my problem. So Jesus is the way. And you know, I don't know what you think about heaven. Forget about the cartoons and just sitting on a cloud and playing a harp and nothing else to do. If you read what the Bible says about heaven, it's going to be amazing. You like, you like beautiful cities? Wait till you see the new Jerusalem. With this river, when you like beautiful, clear rivers, wait till you see the river of life. You like to pick fresh fruit? Wait till you can pick 12 different fruits from the same tree. The tree of life grows along the river. It's going to be an amazing place. We think this world is beautiful in its first state. Can't even compare to that. Well, there have been a lot of changes in my life. I love studying the Bible and teaching it to others. I've enjoyed finding out through deep study that the Bible is absolutely true. And one of the most interesting parts that I found is the creation story because of the science background. I love studying the creation story with a scientific perspective. Sarah and I had a fine marriage before I turned to Christ as my Savior. Now we have a complete marriage. And I'll be eternally grateful for a wife that prayed for me and waited patiently for all those years. You know, it continues to amaze me that God gave me a choice. God gives every one of us a choice. He didn't make us as robots. He lets us choose for him or against him. He wants us to love him freely. That's the only kind of true love there is, right? Where we get to choose to love someone. But we can also get to choose not to love God, not to turn to him. That's why the Bible talks about heaven and hell. You know, we don't like to talk about hell. But Jesus said, 
a lot more about hell than he did about heaven. Not twice as much. That's what he came to save us from. The amazing thing is that people can choose to go there, but no one has to. That's how, how easy God made it for us. And still, as the Bible says, most people will choose hell. How sad. Well, you know, Jesus told a story about a rich man and a beggar, indicating that perhaps the only thing worse than finding ourselves in hell would be to find we have led our families there. That was a true story, not a parable. The Bible says this, if you want nothing to do with Jesus, your wish will be granted. Isn't that amazing? Be granted for eternity. This world and this life is where we get to make the choice. Well, how about your GPS? Is it working? Do you know your destination? From talking to many of you, I'm pretty confident that most of this group at least knows that you've got a home in heaven. And the Bible says clearly that we can know, not just hope so, but we have a no so, a no so faith. You know, if um, I've asked people this before, I said, Do you believe in God? I said, Oh, yeah. They said, Well, do you know that the demons believe in God? And they're not going to heaven. They even called Jesus by name. They knew who he was, didn't they? Well, what's, that's not what's required. What is the difference? The difference is not to just know who Jesus is, but to know Jesus. To have that association, that relationship with him that can only come through inviting him into our lives and submitting to him. No, I really don't know your heart. Only you and God know that. I don't know your history, none of that. That's just between you and God. And if by chance there's someone among us who has never trusted Christ, I would hope that tonight you might take that step. So I'm going to close with a prayer and give you an opportunity in case you have never turned to Christ for your salvation. Let's pray. Father, you know every one of us better than we know ourselves. You love us more than anyone else in this world. And it is your desire for us to have a loving, eternal relationship with you. You provided that by redeeming us through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, paying our sin debt on the cross. We thank you for that. Lord, I would pray if there's anyone in here that has never truly made that commitment, cannot remember a time when they've said, yes, I want to be committed in my life to Christ, that maybe tonight would be that night. And all they need to do is say something like this, that is to recognize that they are a sinner by saying, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I offended you. And to ask Christ to come into my life. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for eternal life. And thank you for saving me. And that could be your prayer tonight. And Lord, I ask now that if someone prayed that, that it was sincere, and that they will know as they leave tonight that they have a new home in heaven, guaranteed. And I thank you for each one that's come. I ask you to bless the rest of this evening to see us safely home. And we thank you for all you've done here this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.